praise, honor, and glory, because you deserve it all, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Oh, praise your name, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. If you can stay standing for just a little bit. I'm uh, honored just to have an opportunity to talk in front of this pulpit. Uh, just so many great teachers. and um, Pastor Yance and just, uh, just, just, I, I'm, you know, there's a lot of things that uh, we need to be careful of, a lot of things we shouldn't be careful of, okay? And one of them is uh, standing here. I want to be in his will and I want to hear his voice. So with that, I would like to start off with Judges chapter 6, verse 12. And we're going to go to 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7. So Judges chapter 6, verse 12. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him and said unto him, The Lord is with thee, the mighty man of valor. I'm talking to Gideon. Second Timothy chapter 1, verse 7. For God hath not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and love and sound mind. My topic today is fear. So I'm going to go a little different direction here. You know, when you know, I get in front of someone, you know, I, I've heard it preached, I've heard Pastor Betcher, I've heard Pastor Yance say this, that, you know, there's two things you can always say. You can give your testimony and the Word of God. So I'm going to start off with part of a testimony. I'll finish it before I'm done. So this testimony is about fear and facing fear. So God made me face fear. Now I'm with family tonight, so I'm going to be very open with you. I'm going to share. My name's not much afraid. It's not the coward, okay? But, you know, I, I think we all deal with anxiety, with fear. So I want to start the story by saying, I drive by the Illinois Youth Center occasionally. I live down by where the Youth Center is, and this is where the prison ministry is. I, I've never seen anyone outside. I, I always wondered if it was abandoned. But I, but I know that God has opened a door through Brother Williams to, to minister to that place. Dominion was given. And this church is, is not these four walls, but this is evidence of that, that we can touch those that God has directed us to. So the prison ministry was announced, and you know something I you know, felt in my heart I needed to be involved. I was for it. I prayed for it. I was ready to get behind it. <laughs> Way behind. <laughs> I was not ready to actually go into a prison. Okay, and so I went and there was a discussion and I'm part of the people that said they want to go into the prison and so this, this began to, you know, you know, go through my mind. You know, when a fear comes into your mind, it, it can become something else. It, it can become a, a roadblock between you and God and His will. So when Brother Williams said, it's time, come, we've got the forms. We're going to fill them out. This is happening. It became real. So when the meeting was called, 
But those that wanted to volunteer, I left. <laughs> I started to drive home. Lots of rationalizations along the way. So thank you very much. <laughs> I love the music, though. You know, it's <laughs> not been here. Very soothing. Fear. This is a God-created mo emotion. God created us. We are fearfully and wonderfully made. And that, that includes the emotions that we carry. But since the fall, since the separation from God, those emotions, you know, are attached to the world and, and they're corrupted. So we even fear. So Bible mentions two types of, of fear. The first type is beneficial and encouraging. The second type is detrimental and is to be overcome. This church, you know, we always talk prayer, fasting, sanctification. Now, there's a reason. You know, when we're close to God, we're separated from that world. You know, there's, there's no corruption. Perfect love cast out fear. So that first type of fear is the fear of the Lord. This type of fear does not necessarily mean to be afraid of something. Rather, it's a reverential awe of God, a reverence for his power and glory. However, it is also a proper respect for his word, mercy, and correction. When I, when I study... I, I always want to write my own definitions, okay? And, and this is not because I'm trying to create new doctrine. Our doctrine is our doctrine, okay? When we need to know our doctrine. I write it down so I can internalize it. And I wrote this definition for the fear of the Lord. A total acknowledgement of all that God is, which comes through knowing him and his attributes, Church, knowing him cannot be passive undertaking. We must set our heart, soul, strength, and mind to understand him. What does Luke 10, 27 say? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength, with all your mind. His word tells us he is and is revealed by the Spirit and that same word. If anyone's wondering about my testimony, I will be getting there eventually. <laughs> I just, just, you know, just, just want to let you know, okay, stay tuned. <laughs> it's coming. <laughs> Unless I chicken out. <laughs> So we all have the ability to be fearful, okay? It's a God-created emotion. We need to make sure that fear is well-placed. It's a feeling or condition of being afraid or anxious. I, I, I think sometimes, you know, if God is trying to direct me in a certain area and I, I can feel the pressure, I, I can get anxious. That's the fear of the Lord. The f definition of fear, distressing emotion aroused by impending danger, or evil, pain, and whether the threat is real or imagined, a feeling or condition of being afraid. So when you have a spirit of fear, which is not come from God, you know, that could be a real fear or imagined fear. This is the point, though. Even if it's a real fear, we have a God that made this world, that made you, that redeemed us and went to a cross, made a way for us 
to know him, to be him, to have his, whole, our, his Holy Spirit in us. Yes. So let's get real here. There's times when we and I kind of have that fear. 1 John 4.18 says, There is no fear in love, but perfect love that casts out fear, for fear has to do with punishment. Another translation said torment. And whoever fears has not been perfect, perfected in love. So if you let fear control yourself, you're getting in the way of that perfect love. Who is that perfect love? That's Jesus. So you can see how fearing God should be encouraged. However, that second type of fear mentioned in the Bible is not beneficial at all. This is the spirit of fear. It's mentioned in 2 Timothy, for God has not given us a, uh, a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. A spirit of fearfulness and timidity does not come from God. Am I allowed to use the word timidity? You know, I, I, I get it, okay? There's the fear that you're, you're anxious about, okay? You're, you're on edge, you cannot sleep. But there's another type where you become passive. You're afraid to reach out. You're afraid to talk to your coworker about Jesus because this is outside the norm. This is also a concern, an anxious moment. And I pray that God keeps me in the fear of God, that checks my spirit. Did you ever experience that you could not do something, you avoided the problem? What about a confrontational pers person? You're kind of like, I'm going to step around this. Okay, because, you know, I don't like confrontation. You know, I, I got to say there's, there's things in my walk with God, okay? When, when, when I came to God, I was empty. I had a hole in my heart. Nothing could fill it until I repented. I went down in that water. And that hole was filled. Yeah. I could not believe it. It was awesome. Yeah. Then the evidence of the Holy Ghost, and then that walk began. Step by step. I don't know where you are, but sometimes it, it gets a little too comfortable. I've been there, and... You know, I feel a need to, to reach out. I feel a need to, you know, not stand where I'm at right now. I can do something for God. This is a wonderful church. I, I tell you what, there, there are so many, so many genuine people, and you're all here tonight, okay? So, <laughs> Pastor will talk to me about that later, okay? Um, but I got to tell you, you are, you are awesome, okay? You're, I, I'm not, I'm just saying that having gone to multiple churches and lived in different parts of the country, wow. And so... You know, I really see that uh, when we take this walk, when we set our feet on the path that Jesus Christ has set, we can understand that he can take us from point A to point B. Because sometimes you're saying, I don't have that ability. I don't have that talent. Okay, do you know talent can be learned? You keep trying, Okay. And God will grow you, and he'll take you to that next level. I tell you what, church, I'm fascinated with the story of Gideon. You know, 
Gideon said unto him, uh, Judges 6, 13, uh, my Lord, if my Lord be with us, then, then why is this all befalling us? And I'm not doing it word for word now, but, you know, all these miracles that our fathers told us about, where are they <laughs> exactly? And, and you know what God said to Gideon? He said, go in this thy might. Okay, now if it was New Testament, you might say, well, the might would be the Holy Spirit, but this is Old Testament. He says, do what you can do. And then he says later on, have I not sent thee? And then Gideon begins to comment again about his uh, position in his family and his family's poor, and God says, surely I will be with thee. Do you hear that, church? He will be with us. It, it doesn't matter. We just got to show up. Okay? And get ready to work. So, I tell you what, church, I can do that. I can show up. How about you? Can you just show up? Okay, I got no talent. You know, Brother Tim hasn't asked me to sing yet. <laughs> it's good reason. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I can show up. So let me continue this testimony, okay? On that drive home, I felt the pull of God, okay? It just surrounded me. It said, where are you going? I got to tell you, this is not some type of self-absorbed guilt trip, Okay? This is not that, okay? I left my pride behind when I left the door, walked out that door. I felt the spirit and I turned that car around, even though I was halfway home. You know, sometimes you get halfway in the wrong direction. Sometimes you get 90% in the wrong direction. You know what? You gotta face God, you gotta start walking that direction. It'll only change yes. if you walk toward Jesus. <laughs> Brother Williams handed me the papers. I thought he was going to ask me, where have you been? <laughs> he didn't, praise God. I could have told him I was fleeing the, uh, Tarshish, though. Uh, read Jonah, you know. It's, he, but, uh, you know, so I, I really, I really um, am just you know thankful that god did that but he wasn't done with me yet because i was still carrying that uh, spirit of fee, fear but he says the mercy of the lord is everlasting to everlasting upon them that fear him and his righteousness unto his children's children i turned around my fear of the lord came upon me and i turned around even though i was carrying that fear god's going to take care of that i couldn't understand why i was being such a big wimp <laughs> I had some fear. It had to go. Yes. And so in prayer, you know, I got through the repentance part, praying for my family. I got through praying for the church, for the pastors, you know, and I got to me where, you know, I began just to talk to the Lord, and he began to explain it to me. You're looking at your fear. You're not looking at me. So, in prayer, it was taken away. God took it. So, go in my own strength. Go in our own strength. We're going to show up. So, the time came. We went to Illinois Youth Center the week before. I felt so much resistance, but I was praying and fasting. Because, you know, I'm going to show up. I've decided. I'm going to look toward Jesus. And God told me to show up. It was not good enough to say we are afraid. I think we need to understand what the origin of that fear is. And I think in prayer, okay, in fasting, in, in that sanctification process, God, God will go touch that place where, where that anxiety is coming from. For th with this, we'll have the confidence in what we say and what we do to do the work of the Lord with the boldness required. 
I know there's going to be an internal impact as a result of the reaching of those young men. Do not neglect to do good to share what you have, for such sacrifices are pleasing to God. So as part of showing up, I will prepare. And I know you're doing the same. I know this church is moving. There's a scripture that I, I just love, and I'll finish with this. You know, the Lord said to Moses, now, now you see what I will do to Pharaoh. Because of my mighty hand, he will let them go. Because of my mighty hand, he will drive them out of this country. And I just love that scripture. Because, you know, you know, being a new convert, I was just like amazed at everything that God would do. I would turn around and there would be God's favor. And so I... I challenge us, I, I ask us, let's stand up, and let's stand up. That means get on your feet. <laughs> yes, it does, every time. <laughs> Maybe on the second time it does, okay? So I, I want us to start praising. So I want you to say, this, this is my comment to you. So let us show up in the spirit of power, love, and a sound mind, for, for this is the fear of the Lord. Let us hear God say to Bartlett Church, now you shall see what I will do. Brother Randy, that was awesome. <laughs> that was awesome. I want to make sure I show up. And I can tell you, I have, the Lord has brought me down many paths where I've had to learn to face fears, and everything he said is absolutely true. I am going to read um, two short scriptures, sort of short scriptures, and I'll let you be seated. The first one is 1 Samuel 10.1. 1 Samuel 10.1. I started bringing my real Bible back to church again. I just love having that. I don't know. I, got, I went through the whole electronic phase and all that, and I'm back to the, I like the paper. 1 Samuel 10.1. This is the ESV version. Then Samuel took a flask of oil and poured it on Saul's head and kissed him and said, Has not the Lord anointed you to be prince over his people Israel? And you shall reign over the people of the Lord, and you will save them from the hand of their surrounding enemies. And this shall be the sign to you that the Lord has anointed you to be prince over his heritage. That was the day that Saul was anointed. Now go to Samuel, 1 Samuel 16, 1. 1 Samuel 16, 1, just a few chapters over. And the Lord said unto Samuel, how long wilt thou mourn for Saul, seeing I have rejected him from reigning over Israel? Fill thine horn with oil and go, and I will send thee to Jesse the Bethlehemite. I don't know if I said that right. Try saying that three times, Bethlehemite. For I have provided me a king among his sons. I want to talk to you just a little bit about two men, two callings, and two divine purposes. You can be seated. You know, I know that we know the story of Saul and David very well. Um, I'm sure that many of you Bible quizzers and many of you that study much more than I do can tell me all of the many um, details of each of their lives. But I got to thinking about how both were anointed by God to be king of Israel. They both were chosen by God to fulfill a purpose. 1 Samuel 10, you don't have to flip to all of these. I'm going to try to go quick on the scriptures. 1 Samuel 10 also says, And the Spirit of the Lord will come upon thee, and thou shalt prophesy with them, and shalt be turned into another man. He's talking to Saul. And it was so that when he had turned his back to go from Samuel, that God gave him another heart 
and all those signs that came to pass that day. So think about that day that Saul was the anointed king and he had all of the blessings and all of the virtue and all of the empowerment in a bright, beautiful future before him. And the Bible says that God turned his heart and equipped him to the point that his countenance basically was different so that he could fulfill the call that God had on his life. So everything's good, right? I'm going to rock it. I'm King Saul. I'm going to be the future king of Israel. And then we look at what, what happened with David. It says, same thing. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers. And the spirit of the Lord rushed upon David from that day forward. 1 Samuel 16, 13. So at this point, both gentlemen were in the same place, basically, right? They both had a call. They both had an anointing. They both had God's promises before them. So what happened? One valued obedience at all costs, and one didn't. And I think sometimes in my own life, I find myself, you know, I'm a, um, as Sister, Sister Betcher likes to say, I'm an orange, I'm an over-the-top orange, and part of what an orange does is we wiggle a lot. We don't just wiggle outside. Like I walk in the office at work and everybody knows I'm there, right? <laughs> um, you probably hear me when I walk in the back door. The other part of that is my nature wiggles a lot. Matter of fact, earlier this week, I was talking with my beloved sister, Betcher, and she asked me to do something, and I said, I can't believe this came out of my mouth. I said, do I have to? <laughs> now, I have sat under this lovely pastor's wife for at least 10 years. I know better, but nonetheless, that's my nature. I wiggle. And I want to say before I launch into this that it's okay to wiggle if you end up in the right place, if you make that right decision. We know the story of Saul's unlawful sacrifice in 1 Samuel 13, right? He got tired of waiting for Samuel. His men were starting to abandon him. Things were starting to take a dive, and he decided, I'm not going to wait for the man of God in my life, who was the only one that was ordained to do that. The king could make a sacrifice for himself, but he was forbidden to do it for the nation. That was the prophet's job. But by that point, Saul had already gotten to the point that he had no respect, obviously, for the anointed man of God in his life. Somewhere along the line, Saul's thinking had already started to shift that I can just do this myself. What's the big deal? I've seen what the anointed does. I know how to do all this. I'm just going to take it in my own hands, and I'm going to do this. And we know in 1 Samuel 15 that Saul did not kill all of the, here I go with the names again, Amalekites, did I say that right? And what's really interesting, if we were to have the time tonight and, I, and you were to read through, when you get home this week, you read 1 Samuel 15, is the arrogance of how much Saul argued with the man of God. Now I'm telling you, I am by no means perfect, as Pastor and Sister Betcher can tell you very well. But if Pastor gave me that look, or Sister Betcher said, uh, Sister Goff, could we meet? <laughs> you know, I'm like, yes, ma'am. Okay, whatever you say, ma'am, right? But Saul already had so much arrogance that he had the audacity to argue with the man of God. Very confrontational. But look what David does. So David, what happened to him? He is running for his life because Saul is after him at this point. He's in the caves. Saul comes in, right, to do his personal business. David and his men are there, and he cut off a corner of his garment, but he could have killed him, and his men were telling him to kill him. And he felt so much remorse that he went out and he apologized right then and there and humbled himself. Do you see the difference? One man chose to obey at all costs. That was David. The other man already figured out, I got this thing. I got this king thing down. I, I got it. I, no problem. One valued the man of God in his life, which we just talked about. And we also talked about how Saul argued with Samuel when confronted. Samuel said to him in, for, in 1 Samuel 15, 9, Why then did you not obey the voice of the Lord? Why did you pounce on the spoil and do what was evil in the sight of the Lord? And Saul said to Samuel, listen to this guy lie. I have obeyed the voice of the Lord, and I have gone on the mission to which the Lord has sent me. That was a bald-faced lie. 
Now, when David, he messed up with Bathsheba, that was wrong. He shouldn't have done that. We know that. But when the prophet Nathan came to him and he said, thou art the man, what does David do? In 2 Samuel 12, 13, he immediately says, then David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. So I want you to, I want you to pause for a minute. And I want you to think about, where are you in that heart meter? It's okay to wiggle. We're human. But when those times come and we get smacked, as I so often say, I guess, what is our response? Do we ball up our fist and wag our finger? Do we go home and do this business? Or do we immediately find ourselves in humility and submission? I believe that David and Saul were given the same opportunity and the same anointed support. But when the tests of obedience came into their lives, David passed his, and Saul didn't. And the reality is, is that their success and failure wasn't God's fault, and it wasn't the man of God's fault. It was their fault. And whether we realize it or not, all through our life, we go from one test to another. It's all in the Bible, isn't it? Here's Abraham and Noah and Moses and Gideon's army and the children of Israel and the walls of Jericho and Rahab's scarlet cord. Over and over and over again throughout the history of the Bible, God's people were given opportunities to choose to do right or to choose to do wrong. This is basic Bible study, right? And yet, do we really realize how many times we have that put in us and we have that put before us? And do we really pay attention to what we respond and how we respond and what's really going on in there? Because I kid you not, before God, I believe that we're going through the same kind of test. And I believe that every day and every decision and every action and every reaction is determining the course of our destiny. And there is that time that will come if we do not heed and we do not submit and we do not do the things that we all know to do that God could look at us and say, okay, I'm sorry, but I've moved to another. So the reality is, is that our obedience and our adherence to the totality of the word of God is what determines our destiny and has a profound effect, not just on us, but on our children and on our children's children. Look at Exodus 20, verse 6. You shall not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on their children to the third and the fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing loving devotion to a thousand generations to those who love me and keep my commandments. So our choices our responses, how we're scoring on the test of obedience in our lives doesn't just affect us. It doesn't just affect our future and our destiny, but it affects our children and our children's children and our children's children's children. We all know families, and I was trying to think of a really good positive one to use because I didn't want to, so, and I don't even see them all here tonight. But there was a time, and I know now they're, they're getting older and they've got kids of their own, but there was a time if there was a project at the church that needed to be done and any one of the Rodriguez's were involved, they were all there. They were all there helping. If it was, you know, doing Friends Sunday or whatever, that was something that the Rodriguez family has always been known for, right? They're there. They, they, they pull together. They help one another. And you can look in each family amongst yourselves or people that you know out in your neighborhood and every family kind of has a theme or a temperament, don't they? There's those that are workers and helpers and doers, and there's those that aren't. There's those that are always really positive, and there's those that aren't. And sadly, there's those that are known for supporting and standing and upholding the ministry and the man of God. And maybe there's those that aren't so much. I don't know. Where do you think that comes from? 
That comes from the head of the household and the people that are molding and shaping that home and how they're faring in their test of obedience. That's where that comes from. So most of us pass the big test, I think. I think, I think by and large, we get the big stuff right, right? We follow the plan of salvation. We obey the Ten Commandments. We do our best to love our neighbors. We try to do good to others. And we do a pretty good job, as Brother Randy pointed out, of showing up and not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. I think we get the big stuff. But I know in my own self, it's the little things. It's that little whatever it is that's just bumping me. The Song of Solomon, chapter 2, verse 15 says, Take us the foxes, the little foxes that spoil the vines. And Galatians 5, 9 says, This false teaching is like a little yeast that spreads through the whole batch of dough. So we know that the little things can actually turn out to be a really big something. And I had a lot of fun doing research on this because I love the history stuff and all that kind of stuff. You would not believe how many articles and how many YouTube videos and how many everything there is on crazy little stupid things that upended all of history. So I'm going to share just a couple with you. The Titanic may have been saved with just a key, a regular key. Just before it set sail, set sail, the company that ran the Titanic replaced the ship's second officer. On that fateful night, the iceberg was spotted too late, and disaster was unavoidable because they, the lookout did not have binoculars. Where was the key? In a locker that the new second officer never, never got. So the key that could have saved him to have the binoculars was locked up inside a locker. Failing to read a note led to George Washington's victory at Trenton. During the American Revolution, George Washington famously crossed the Delaware River and defeated the Hessians in Trenton. It turned out that the Hessian commander failed to read a note warning of the attack. It was found sealed in his pocket after dying on the battlefield. Last one on history, and I'll go on. An unlocked gate caused the fall of Constantinople. In 1453, the Ottoman Empire attacked and took Constantinople, a city that survived a thousand years worth of sieges. How did they do it? Someone forgot to lock the gate. This defeat effectively marked the end of the Middle Ages, the start of Ottoman domination and the beginning of the Renaissance. I really do believe that it's the little foxes. It's the little foxes of the heart, of the lips, of the body. I'm going to tell you a story that the Lord quickened in my mind. I hadn't thought of it in a long, long time. I was a bus kid. I came to the Lord, got the Holy Ghost at age like 11. Shortly thereafter, my single mom came in and um, got the Holy Ghost and started going to church. And a family in the church welcomed us into their home. And so it became a ritual that most would then, back then we had Sunday morning, Sunday night. Most Sunday nights, we would go over to this family's house, and they would have snacks or cook a hamburger or whatever, and we would sit around the kitchen table and have a snack together and talk. Sounds great, right? Fellowship, fellowship of the saints. Only this particular family would then sit at the table and dissect everything in the ministry that they didn't like. How the preacher preached, who shook their hand, who didn't shake their hand, you name it. And I can remember, now I was like 12, and I can remember then bawling up inside like, don't talk about them like that. I love them. I made it through that. My mom didn't. So what am I saying? What I'm trying to challenge you to, to think about is, am I doing or thinking anything that's affecting my salvation? Am I doing or thinking anything that is affecting my neighbor's salvation? If it's the little foxes that spoil our vine, and we are part of the big vine of Christ, then our actions don't just weaken us, do they? but they weaken the entire body, at least for a season. 
John 15 says, I am the true vine and the father is, my, is the husbandman. And it goes on in verses four and five and says, abide in me and I in you. As a branch cannot bear fruit of itself except it abide in the vine. No more can ye except ye abide in me. I am the vine and ye are the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me, ye can do nothing. So my vine, let's say I got little wiggles in there and my vine's not so healthy right now. And I'm attached to the big vine of Jesus Christ who's flowing with health. And he's created, did you guys know you're all potted plants? I just realized that we're one great big potted plant in here. And all of our vines are interconnected. You ever seen those that they just climb the wall? And some are healthy and some are not so healthy. And we're all helping each other. And we're all kind of trying to, you know, to, to bump along and make sure that we're doing okay. But if we're not careful, not only do we affect ourselves and our own eternal destiny, when we affect our children and our children's children and our children's children's children, but we are affecting the almighty kingdom of God. We think that our actions are just about our little bubble. But the reality is, is it is affecting the work and the purpose that he is trying to accomplish on this earth. And we are given a season, a season to get it right. But I kid you not, it's example after example after example in the Holy Bible that there will come a time when the Lord will take his shears and he will say, I'm sorry, but I have got a great and a mighty work for this church in Bartlett. And they are going to win many souls, and they are going to be a beacon on a hill. And if you continue to be an infestation in the vine, my vine, the vine of Christ, and it is not contributing to the safety of those that I'm trying to bring in, then there will come a time, as it did with Saul, that he says, I'm sorry, but I need I need to remove you from that attachment. And, and in, in our mind, at least in mine, I like to think that all that happened with Saul and Samuel told him, you know, you're toast, you're done, it's over. And then the next day, David just jumped up and, hey, everybody, I'm your king. But we know that's not what happened, is it? Think about how many years that Saul lived knowing that he blew it. And where was his focus? There was no repentance that I saw. He started to focus on the one that God favored. And so I tell you before God that if you find yourself in a place that you're struggling with stuff inside and against anyone that you see incredible anointing or blessing or whatever it may be, be careful that you aren't struggling against the one that God has said, okay, I'm putting my blessing there. I'm putting my anointing there because we all want to be healthy, don't we? We all want to see our loved ones saved. When I'm the one that has a serious illness, I want to be able to run here and know that there is power and authority and victory to be saved. But if I... And one of the ones that's poking a hole in the wall. And the storm comes. Then all of a sudden there's something wrong and it's not, it's not happening. And if I could challenge you to take a big step back. We all, I try sometimes, I make myself. I am not going to pray about myself today or any of my needs. I'm going to start really wide and God bless President Trump and everything else. And I'm going to work my way in. Right? Right? But sometimes I do it the other way around. But if, if, I could, if I could challenge you to take a great big step back and realize that we live in a culture of disrespect. It's in the news. It's, a, it's everywhere you go. There is no respect for authority. There's no respect for the office of the president. Whoever your preference is for president, that's not what I'm saying. There's no respect for the uniform. There's no respect for the police. There's no respect. And we can bring that into the church. And we can affect the cause of Christ. I can affect the cause of Christ with my mouth, 
with my looks, with my actions, and I want a safe place for my children and my children's children. And I want to rock this world for Jesus Christ before it's over. And I'm going to tell you before God, it isn't going to happen if we don't all worry about the health of the vine. You know, I, I keep saying I love history. I'll quit saying that. But, you know, Alexander the Great, he went undefeated for battles for, for 15 years. He didn't lose one. He died when he was 32. He was a maniac. I mean, he was like the most brilliant strategist ever, and I'm not going to take the time to tell you all the details. But I will tell you that he had a reputation for demanding absolute obedience and allegiance to the king and to the purpose that they were, and to their cause. And I want you to think about the king of kings. He's up there, and he's looking down on Bartlett. And he's positioned us for an incredible purpose. How many phenomenal men and women of God have come through and said, you guys are going to blow the roof off Chicago and this and this and this and this. And our king is looking down and he's waiting for us to get the vine healthy. I'm not saying we're in bad shape. I'm just saying maybe we could all do a little better. I know I could. And to have such allegiance to the king to the king his purpose his calling his design for this area he wants to see hundreds and thousands saved but we as a body need to work on the little foxes we need to think about Am I in this moment when I'm mad or I'm frustrated? Am I responding as a Saul or am I responding as a David? Because we all are human. Would you stand? You know, I remember Brother Hernandez saying that the average, the average altar call was seven minutes. I don't know, he said that a couple times, passing the mantle. And I know that midweek service and we come down and we pay our respects and if we're not careful, we can be thinking about, I need to get home, I need to do this, I need to do that. But in a minute, I'm going to ask you to come. And, and I know we've already prayed that prayer of repentance and I think it's a fabulous thing that we do every service. But I wonder, and I know in my own self, I've been trying to challenge myself to pray more along those lines because I don't believe for one minute that there's one person sitting in this room that intentionally wants to be a Saul or wants to affect the body in a negative way. I don't believe that. But we all can unintentionally with our way of looking and our way of processing or thinking or the little things that we get inside. So I'm going to ask you in a moment when you come, I'm going to lead you in a prayer of repentance. And I, again, I know we did that earlier. But I'm going to ask you to, to really allow the Lord to do what it is that he's, he's wanting to do inside. I'm telling you, as I was preparing for this message today, I was shuddering in the presence of God because I was so overwhelmed with how intense he was wanting to get this message across. And I'm like, God, if it's me... You know, cut me off at the knees. Do what you got to do. So I'm going to invite you to come on down, and you can play. And I want, us, I want us to really reflect, and I want us to really seek the Lord in repentance. Lord Jesus, God, I ask that you search our hearts, Lord. I ask that you remove any offense inside, God. Lord, I ask, God, that you protect us from our own opinion from our way of looking at things, oh God. Would you walk amongst the chambers of our heart? Oh God, we want to be like you.
I don't want anything in me, God, that would cause a stumbling block to your kingdom. God, if I've let a hurt or a wrong or an injustice in my mind that I perceive get in the way of what you want to do, Lord, I ask that you remove it. God, I ask you to break my will, break my sense of entitlement, oh God. Purge the deep, deep place in my being, oh God. Wash me, Lord Jesus. Wash me, God, from every part, from pride, from anger, from resentment, oh God. Purify me, Jesus. Help me, God, to be humble before you. Help me to have a humble response, oh God. Help me to think of your kingdom and your ways and your purposes, oh God. That we would seek you and you alone, that it would be for your cause, oh God. That we would not think of ourselves, oh God, deliver us from self-importance. Deliver us, oh God, from thinking that we have a right to anything. You are the mighty God. You are the everlasting Father. You are the Prince of Peace. You are sovereign, oh God, and you have the right to do anything in my life that you choose. You know my next breath. You hold it in your hand. It is appointed unto a man wants to die, and after that, the judgment. Oh God, we will stand before you. You will look, oh God, into our hearts. And you beck at us and you call us and you woo us and you draw us to be more like you. It is your will that none should perish and that all should come to eternal life. Help us, oh God. Help us to respond to your spirit, oh God. To not be habitual, Lord. To not be in a hurry, oh God. But to allow your brokenness, Lord, to break us. You hung on a tree for us. You gave all, oh God. You gave us opportunity. You brought us into the body. You crafted us into your vine, oh God. Help us to be a healthy, contributing factor to your kingdom. Help us to love your kingdom, Lord. To love souls and to love one another. To put our own agendas aside, oh God. Oh God, teach us a newfound respect, oh Lord, for your anointing. God, I ask that you would teach us, God, to respect the ministry as never before. God, that we would have such a fear and such a reverence for you, oh God, that you, Lord Jesus, would be first and foremost on our mind. Oh God, bless these wonderful people. Anoint them, oh God. Anoint their minds and their hearts as they seek you, God. I ask that your presence, I ask that your presence wash us, cleanse us, cover us in your blood, oh God. Cover us in your blood, oh God. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those that trespass against us, oh God. Your word says that my people will humble themselves and pray and turn from their wicked ways. Then will I hear from heaven and I will heal their land. We all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Oh God, I am the chief among them, Lord. There is none of us, God, that are perfect and there is none of us, God, that are beyond the need to seek you in humble repentance, oh God. We love you, we love you, we love you, we love you.